the God-man. The more we get to know Jesus Christ, the more we should be in awe of who he really is. Here's Dr. Gene Getz. In relationship to this principle that I've called the God-man, that God was in Christ, Jesus Christ was both God and man, a great, great mystery. But it's the essence of, of the salvation message. And personally, I've, I've been reviewing who Jesus Christ really is. I've been using a book by Dr. John Walvoord, who's now with the Lord. And he wrote a book called Jesus Christ Our Lord. It's a very thorough study of Christ, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Jesus Christ, for example, His pre-incarnate manifestations that we find when we read about the angel of the Lord, that was a, really a pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, you have the incarnate picture that we see in the New Testament when God became a man, when He became flesh. And it's just been a powerful experience uh, just reviewing all of that. I would recommend it for your own reading because it relates to this principle regarding the, the God-man. And what we read here is that Matthew helps us to understand this principle about the God-man in a very, very specific way. Now let me, uh, ju let me just review. Jesus Christ, prior to the Sermon on the Mount, had been going everywhere, teaching, healing, and the crowds were gathering. Of course, He's now settled in to the Galilean region, particularly uh, there, in probably His hometown or where He stayed. He didn't have a home of His own, but probably stayed in Capernaum, uh, perhaps in Peter's house or perhaps in Zebedee's house, the father of, of James and John. And, and Jesus uh, now returns. He comes down from the mountain. He went up to get away from the crowds, but when He came down from the mountain, the crowds were beginning to gather again. And here's where he begins to work miracles. It's really fascinating that when he brought the Sermon on the Mount, we don't see any reference to his working miracles. He was just teaching. And as we've seen, it's a powerful presentation of how we should live in view of who Jesus Christ is. But once again now, once he comes down from the mountain, he begins to work miracles to verify who he really is. For example, Chapter 8, we have healing a leper. We also have, in verses 5 through 13, healing the centurion's servant. And let me just simply say that this is the first reference in Matthew to his relating to a Gentile. Beyond the Jewish community, there were Gentiles who were really converts, probably, to Judaism. And this centurion comes on behalf of his servant. And the interesting thing is, it says that Jesus was amazed at this man's faith. He said, I haven't seen faith like this even among the people of Israel. So we have a very uh, significant miracle. We then have healing Peter's mother-in-law. Now, to give you a little perspective on this, let me take you, as it were, uh, to Capernaum. And this is where Jesus basically uh, lived for about 18 months. He didn't have a house of his own, but what we have here in this picture are houses that literally these are the foundation of houses from the time of Jesus' day. And Jesus may have lived in one of these houses or stayed in one of these houses owned by, as I said, Zebedee or by the Apostle Peter. Because if you had a larger perspective, you would see that Jesus came out of the synagogue and He went across to what looks like kind of a spaceship. <laughs> That's actually a church that is built. But if you go underneath, that's Peter's home where he, Jesus went across from the synagogue, went into that home and healed Peter's mother-in-law. That takes you to a literal experience, and it's fascinating to be there. Some of you in this room have been there with us. Now, Jesus, again, 
begins to work miracles, what happened? The crowds, again, came from all over. In fact, we read that when He healed Peter's mother-in-law, Jesus was staying there overnight, probably, and it says that people came from all over, and Jesus healed people. He taught them. He healed them way into the night while the crowds were gathering. So once again, we kind of come full circle because Jesus wants to get away from the crowds. And how did He do it? Well, a different way this time. Look at verse 18 of chapter 8. When Jesus saw large crowds around Him, He gave the order to go to the other side of the sea. As He got into the boat, His disciples followed Him. Now let me give you another interesting uh, bit of history. I'm going to show you what is now called the Jesus boat. That is a boat you're looking at that was discovered, buried on the seashore, and it, they have traced that boat back to the time of Jesus. Now we're not saying that this was the boat, the very boat that Jesus got into, but it could have been. They call it the Jesus boat. And by the way, let me just simply say that that boat is 30 feet long, 12 feet wide, and it's 5 feet deep. So it's a relatively sizable boat. And so when the disciples got into this boat, you can imagine that probably Peter was there, and Andrew, and James, and John, and maybe Philip, Nathaniel, perhaps some of the others, but this boat would be large enough, and it's large enough for Jesus to fall asleep. And that, by the way, is another fascinating uh, manifestation of His humanity. He was tired. And so he fell asleep. And we read about this. He got into his boat. The disciples followed him. But notice this frightening experience. Suddenly, suddenly, and let me just underscore, in the Sea of Galilee, or on the Sea of Galilee, a storm can come up, even to this day, suddenly, with huge waves. It happens even to this day. It happened then. Suddenly, a violent storm arose on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. That had to be a big storm if the boat was the size we just looked at. But He, Jesus, was sleeping. So the disciples came and woke Him up, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to die. And let me just underscore, when they said, Lord, they were simply saying, Master, they really still didn't know who Jesus Christ was and is. And we read about this in terms of what happened, the miracle. And here's the miracle. But He, Jesus, said to them, Why are you fearful, you of little faith? You see, they didn't really know who was sleeping in that boat. Then He got up, He rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the sea obey him. They're in process of discovering that Jesus Christ was indeed the God-man. Isn't it fascinating how you see the interrelationship between the human and the divine? Jesus was fully human, but He was fully divine. And to try to comprehend that is, is beyond anything that we can imagine. But it's true. And again, in the book I just referred to you earlier, Dr. Walver's book on Jesus Christ our Lord, he traces through this whole concept of this human and this divine, this miraculous union that existed when God became a man and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ, our Lord, the God-man. So that leads us to a question that I want you to think about. When you read Paul's description of the Lord Jesus Christ in Colossians, 
How would you evaluate your true understanding and emotional responses to who the Savior really is? I want you to think about that because I'm going to read what Paul wrote about Jesus Christ, the God-man. This is what he wrote. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by Him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and by Him all things hold together. As I read that passage, and as I have read that passage on various occasions, my mind goes to what John said in his gospel. Listen to these words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him. That sounds like Paul, doesn't it? In Colossians. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him not one thing was created that has been created. He was a God-man. Well, Paul goes on here in his letter to the Colossians. And notice, beginning in verse 18, He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him. Think about that. And through Him to reconcile everything to Himself by making peace through the blood of the cross, His cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And again, my mind went to the correlation that we read in the Gospel of John. Because John wrote, He came to His own. He became a man. He came, first of all, to the Jews. He was a Jew. And that's what we've seen here in the Gospel of Matthew. He's ministering to His own people. He came to His own, and His own people did not receive Him, but to all who did receive Him. He gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in His name, who are born not of blood or the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. You see the correlation with what Paul wrote in Colossians when he talks about the church. Those of us who put our faith in Christ, both Jew and Gentile, He came for us to give us new birth and new life. And then John culminates, he said, the Word became flesh. Jesus Christ, the Word who was in the beginning, the Word who created all things. The Word became flesh and took up His residence among us. And John said, We observed His glory, that glory is the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So with this incredible miracle, and can you imagine, with His voice, He stilled the storm. Why? because He was the God-man. Let's remember this principle to live by. The more we get to know Jesus Christ, the more we should be in awe of who He really is.